We certainly have a ton of Whitey Bulger mischief going on these days. Books, now this, movies, everything. It's, it's, Sightings. Hard, it's hard to keep up with it all, Your Honor. Uh, and good morning. I'm Robert Cosgrove for the Commonwealth uh, on, uh, on this appeal, um, which I guess addresses uh, from the Commonwealth's uh, Point of view whether there should be a Whitey Bulger exception uh, to the rule of uh, due diligence. And in addressing that, uh, since our time is, uh, is limited, uh, I would like to uh, examine it from the vantage point of uh, the defendant's 1991 motion for new trial. Uh, Mr. Cosgrove, can I just ask you this right up front? I I is it um, is it the Commonwealth's position, and I, I, I don't mean to push you into one box or another, is it, the, is it the Commonwealth's position that the judge's conclusion with respect to the um, likelihood that had this evidence been disclosed, there was serious risk of injury to whoever disclosed the evidence is false, or that even if that conclusion is correct as a matter of law, that doesn't protect you in waiting for 20 odd years before you come forward with the evidence? Um, I, well, Although I'm not sure I wish to choose either door or box, if I have to choose one, it's definitely very much in the direction of the latter argument, Your Honor, because I think uh, to say uh, the reverse, um, the realistic fact is in, in, in that any sort of uh, criminal case, the, the witnesses and the defendants and uh, the other parties involved um, are... Uh, Often, unfortunately, people with uh, all, all signs in this case point to seem to point to the fact that these two guys were joint venturers. That's correct. One did the killing; the other drove the car. That's correct. That was that was the Commonwealth's theory, although we could never assemble oh, no, enough evidence with respect to. couldn't find out who the driver was. To Barrett, and in, in, in fact, the the letter, ironically, on which the uh, the defendant relies as newly discovered evidence. Uh, says on the face of it that Barrett had a conversation with uh, uh, with Weichel a couple of weeks after the murder and, and told him of, of of his involvement. So I, I, I take it if if I can just um, place that a little further. I take it that the jury <clears throat> um, that the evidence in front of the jury was that this defendant was not the driver of the car. Is, is, was, was that evidence clear? Yes, I think that was absolutely you clear. Had an, John, identi an identification. That's correct. Uh, well, you have, as you know, there were two vigorous dissents in the underlying case, but that it seemed to me went to a slightly, I mean, in, in the upholding of the conviction, the first go around, correct? Yes, um, uh, but but to answer your question, uh, John, uh, this is actually uh, something of a uh, little mistake that the motion judge makes in his findings of fact. Uh, I don't know that it's material. He says that uh, although no one actually saw uh, the defendant get into the car, I, or I the, saw that. the, the I shooter saw get that. into the car, the jury could reasonably infer. But in fact. Uh, John Foley specifically testified that he saw him get into the car. So and get into the car. That's why I asked on the passenger side. 
Um, uh, the reason why I ask is because if we get to the sort of joint venture piece, mm -hmm. if, if the jury, <clears throat> if the jury could have concluded, uh, you know, a fair inference that that there was not a second person, in other words, that he got into the driver's side, then there was no other evidence, as I understood it, before the jury that anybody else was involved. In other words, there was no evidence that there were two people seen running. There was one person seen running, correct? I, I'm, I don't believe that Foley specifically testified before the jury that he got into the passenger side, although I believe there was testimony that as soon as he got into the car, the door opened, he got in the car, and the car was moving uh, uh, more or less instantaneously. But for purposes of... Uh, what, what, what I'm trying to get at, Mr. Koslow, and forgive me for constantly interrupting you, is that the Commonwealth may have thought there were two people, correct? I'm now looking from the jury's point of view, okay? But I'm if not the jury could have concluded that there was only one person, and that one person was in fact ballot, then we have a very different position than if the jury knew that there were two people and the fact that ballot wasn't named and whether the one was the driver or not the driver, that's a whole other kettle of fish. It's, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to deal with that because Barrett was largely, the second person was largely out of the Commonwealth's case because we didn't have the horses to present it. So it's hard to go back and put that in front of the jury. But I don't think in terms of looking at the corroboration piece for declaration against interest, if you can, if I can skip ahead to way ahead of where I intended to be at my argument at this point. Uh, I don't think you're limited to looking at what was before the jury. You can look at the testimony of, of Lisa Krauss uh, at the motion to uh, suppress uh, pretrial. Uh, mm -hmm. She didn't testify at trial, uh, by the but way, she, she I, did I try you, it. I think you offered to give us that, correct? I don't think that's here, and I would, we would appreciate that. I, I'd be happy to give you that, and I'd be happy to give you the trial oh, transcripts thanks. if yeah. they would be helpful yeah, yeah. to you. Um, let me. Uh, so this is the mo this is her testimony in the motion to suppress before the trial, and she says what? Um, I, I think it's. I, I don't recall the exact words, but I believe it's clear from her testimony that the uh, the car is waiting and that they see the uh, uh, defendant get in from the passenger side. Um, well, why don't you give us those transcripts? Sure. And it's important for this reason. It may be. It may be that you don't have sufficient evidence um, to convict Ballot for uh, murder in the first degree on a theory of joint venture. But if, in fact, the jury knew that there were two people present and arguably involved, then the fact that somebody says the other one pulled the trigger seems to me to be less of a problem than if there's only one person at the scene. Oh, certainly. And there's no question that there was all kinds of evidence that was available to the Commonwealth relative to the relationship between uh, this defendant yeah. isn't, and Isn't uh, your main Tom point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I may very well be wrong, but isn't your main point here that this defendant knew this letter or this information was out there for a number of years, maybe 20 years, whatever, and, and because of Whitey Bulger, um, never got around to getting it. Am I right? And then your point is, why should this be newly discovered evidence if he knew or should have known there might be some exculpatory stuff in, in this letter? That's correct, given the motion judge's crediting of the Whitey Bulger story, which, which we dispute, but basically I'm not here to I mean, to there's a number the of other ways he could have dealt with this. He could have come forward. He could have asked for protection. He could have, you know, a thousand different things could have been done. But to upset trials over this kind of thing is somewhat unrealistic, impractical. Can you retry this case if it comes to that? Do you know? Well, it certainly would be very difficult, Your Honor. Uh, John Foley is still alive, so that uh, that piece would be there. Uh, there is at least one other witness who is deceased. Some of the evidence yeah. is no longer in existence. But 
You have the, the, trans you have the transcripts of the first trial. That's correct. That's which correct. could be admitted into evidence appropriately. That's correct. Let, uh, me, let, me, let me ask you this, because I, uh, I understand it's a fair point that the judge who granted this motion for a new trial did not deal with the issue of waiver, and, um, or at least didn't deal with it directly. And uh, because uh, uh, the defendant had this letter written by Mr. Barrett, or at least was aware of this letter, it was written in 1982, um, and um, uh, certainly had reason to believe there was uh, exculpatory information in the letter, uh, that he should have raised this at least in his motion for a new trial in 1991, that in fact Mr. Barrett had confessed to the crime and specifically said that he, Mr. Weichel, hadn't done it. That surely in the motion for a new trial in 1991, it should have been raised, if not at trial. Of course, the letter didn't exist at the time of trial, but the information that Barrett did it, or was probably the one who did it, was certainly within Weichel's reach. So one way or the other, you're saying this is a waived issue, and the judge didn't deal with waiver, right? That's absolutely correct. Right. But we know that even if it's a waived issue, the judge can still deal with it and can still decide, as I'm quoting Lefebvre here, uh, the power to give relief when a waived issue is raised for the first time by a post-conviction motion for a new trial should be, exercised, should be exercised only in extraordinary cases, where upon sober reflection it appears that a miscarriage of justice might otherwise result. Isn't that what the judge is really saying here, although he doesn't deal with the waiver issue? Well, if he's really saying it, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty well concealed. Uh, I don't find that in there at all. Well, he starts his discussion with saying newly discovered evidence and or ineffective assistance of counsel, and he never mentions um, uh, ineffective assistance of counsel. So, and he's talking about things that happened before the, the new trial, correct? I'm, I'm not sure I followed your question, Your Honor, well, but he's talking that, about I think he's that's He's clearly talking about newly discovered evidence, and he's talking about evidence that everybody understands was available before the motion for the new trial, correct? Right. He never really talks about the motion for the new trial at all. In fact, l let me call your attention to something that he specifically says. <clears throat> Which, he, do you have the page? It's on page 376 of the record, according no, to my what's notes. What's the page of his ruling? <laughs> uh, be page 11, I think. Okay, go ahead. He says, at the time Gloria Weichel told her son about the letter. Now remember, this is nine and a half years before the motion for the new trial. At the time Gloria Weichel told her son about the letter, Bulge's threats to him were fresh. Weichel had been convicted of murder just months earlier. Bulge's words would have been at the peak of their potency. Right. Well, the next thing one might expect to hear is the reason why they were still at their potency nine and a half years after the mother tells the letter, tells him that she has a letter from Barrett saying that he's innocent. Nine and a half years uh, after the mother allegedly tells her, tells Weichel that uh, <coughs> two people are showing up at the door asking about the letter, which again suggests there's probably more in it than a friend's expression that uh, he thinks his, uh, his friend is innocent. And 10 years after the defendant uh, told me during cross-examination, he realized that the Commonwealth's theory was that Barrett was the driver. Well, this is important because if it is in fact waived, as Judge Cordy pointed out, then the whole analysis turns to a likelihood of a miscarriage of justice, which appears to be different than the judge's analysis, which no, was straight out, should there was justice done and so forth, where he has a lot more discretion. Am I right on this or wrong? You're absolutely right on Mr. that. Mr. Cosgrove, maybe I'm leading, am I right in leading the order of uh, December 20, 2002? Is that the memorandum of decision on defendant's motion for a new trial? There's, there's, there's two memoranda of decision. There's a, uh, yeah, but uh, the, first, the, the one I'm leading, he's, it says the defendant has waived his right to raise these issues. Uh, could, could you the, give me a page reference, Your Honor? I'm on, page, I'm on page 11 of that order, and it has a little black 189, which is probably the record appendix. I'm sorry, it's been pulled out of the record appendix. I don't see that on the page. You, you, page 189? Well, it's got a little black and white. 
at the top, 189. In any case, I don't want to. Uh, the, the defendant raised the issue of ineffective assistance of counsel with respect to uh, his trial attorney, Tony Cardinale, with, right. uh, with respect to four or five aspects. Uh, and the, the this judge. Is, this is clearly the one that says, "Go ahead, have an evidentiary hearing on the on the." Right, and and, and Judge Bornstein al alternatively found one that the issue of ineffective assistance of counsel had been waived, and two that uh, Attorney Cardinale was effective with respect to those issues. So we're sort of. At, at, at the point that uh, I was directing the court's attention to, we're sort of beyond that, and we're discussing the uh, the, uh, the, the discovered evidence. I, 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 the way I read that is he's saying all of these have been waived. I'm now going on a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice, and I'm going to have an evidentiary hearing. That's how I read that, and maybe I'm wrong. But in any case, everybody agrees we hear on a substantial risk, correct? Well, I, I don't necessarily agree that we're here on a substantial risk because I don't think the judge addressed that or found that. Now, if, if this court wants to look at it from the point of view of uh, whether you're going to recognize uh, a necessity or, or, or coercion uh, exception uh, to that uh, a whole line of cases placing the burden of proof on the defendant to show that evidence is newly discovered, then maybe we're here on a substantial risk. But it, it doesn't seem to me that you need to even reach that to find that the judge erred in this case. Because uh, let, let's assume that we agree with you that it was waived. Okay? I'm with you. Aren't I now in a substantial risk? Because I, I'm just going back to the, the finding that he made, that we, you know, that, that Right at the time, the letter, the mother, the mother had been visited. You know, he'd been told not to say anything. Um, but what does that mean about five years later or ten years later? I, I don't disagree with you. I guess okay. my only point is the judge didn't perceive himself to yeah. be under okay. a substantial okay. risk. He was really Go ahead. I, I'm just curious if you would agree with me that if, if we agree with the trial judge, are we uh, creating a formula for uh, motions for new trials in the future where someone says, I was afraid of danger from someone in my community, and, uh, and I'll add in an anonymous letter that says, you know, your son didn't do it, uh, but I can't tell you who did do it. Is that the, the formula then in the future for uh, motions for new trials? I, I would expect that uh, the court would be reviewing the reasonableness of, of a great number of these uh, types of decisions if you're going to recognize this sort of exception. I, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, that may be a self-serving answer on my part, but I don't think there's any other realistic answer to give you. I think you're going to see a lot of these. Uh, and I think it would be a mistake uh, to shoehorn in under substantial risk theory uh, an exception that allows a defendant's duty uh, to be shaped by threats, if indeed there really are any, from criminal elements rather than uh, the very sensible line of decisions that this court has followed now for years and years. Mr. Cosgrove, let me ask you one other thing. This now has to do with the judge's second decision on the quote, newly discovered evidence. <clears throat> and at some point, he says, uh, this is not a case where the defendant sat on his rights, correct? You know, he says that. No, no, I understand yeah. that. But I take it, I take it that the Commonwealth's position is there were two people involved here. There was every reason for him to sit on his rights, whether or not there were death threats at the time, because the longer he goes the less likely it is that the Commonwealth can retry the case. I can't look into the defendant's mind and, and, and weigh the pros and cons, but, but certainly that is uh, one possible advantage well, I, I to the I guess, decrease. again, I go, back to the first, I, I go back to the first question, which was if, if he gets a new trial and if Ballot's letter is admissible, along with whatever other evidence there is, that Ballot was in fact the shooter, 
I assume that the Commonwealth will then proceed on a joint venture theory, correct? Yes, I, I mean, that, I'm not, I think I'm not that's asking likely. you to, but I mean, it's, in other words, the Commonwealth has never said, they, the Commonwealth theory has never been only one perpetrator, correct? It, it, it has never been and it is, is not today and uh, I think uh, practically the first words out of my mouth to uh, Judge Bornstein at the very initial hearing as to whether we should have a hearing was when, when he asked me if I was concerned by this letter was that it was always our theory that there were, were two people involved and that there was the relationship between this defendant and Tommy Barrett. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Thank you very much. Ms. Fitzsimmons. Your Honors, good afternoon. Carol Fitzsimmons on behalf of Frederick Weichel. What's important here is that although these new, these, this motion for new trial started as a result of a letter, during the course of the trial, further new evidence was established wherein we had a live witness testify that the confession was made directly to her no, no, I understand by Mr. That. Barrett. I understand that, but you have to, this court has, a, has already considered and by a majority of the justices decided that the evidence against your client being present and participating in some manner in this, I mean, I don't know whether, I, I have no idea what Mr. Barrett looks like. I frankly don't even know at the present time what your client looks like. Um, but that the theory of the Commonwealth from the beginning is that there were two perpetrators here. So even assume this letter gets in and even assume that the testimony of the woman gets in, who can say this is what Ballard told me, he confessed to this, how does that help your client? Because, Your Honor, the testimony at trial was that the, the shooter got in the vehicle. Nobody saw whether there was a driver of this vehicle. Nobody saw that. The testimony is clear. Nobody saw two people. They saw one individual run from the scene, get in the car, and the car left the scene. Isn't the question here not what she testified to, but whether this whole business is newly discovered within our line of fairly tight line of cases? I mean, this fellow had, what, 10, 15 years to come up with this stuff and didn't do it? So it all comes down to the Whitey Bulger thing, right? Your Honor, he Which knew sounds there was, fishy to me. He knew there was a letter but did not know of the contents. Judge Bornstein had him on the stand sized his credibility up and found him to be highly credible that he did how not did, know. How did he even get to that? How did Judge Bornstein even get to that without waiver? And I have to say, you know, when I, when I read the first two orders, I just assumed that he was saying they were all waived and he was going ahead. But it may well be that he didn't even address waiver with respect to newly discovered. Why wasn't this waived? This is not waived because the defendant did not know of the contents of the letter and had no reason to believe that it contained anything. Right, but it seems to me, though, there's a more fundamental waiver problem here, and that is, as, as I understood it, Attorney Cardinale, with full knowledge, with full knowledge that Barrett might well be involved in this crime, because he heard that from the Commonwealth, made a strategic decision not even to investigate the subject of Barrett's involvement. So it's not just a question of could a, could a specific piece of evidence about Barra have been discovered at this time or at that time or, or whatnot, but a, but a strategic decision that uh, he did not want to uncover evidence about Barrett's involvement for fear that that might help the Commonwealth's case uh, rather than hurt it. There's nothing in the record that indicates that he made any strategic decision. He testified at the hearing that the, the Commonwealth had provided no information other than an informant that two informants that Barrett and Weichel were involved in the murder. Attorney Cardinale testified. He indicated that he was not aware that that was the theory of the Commonwealth on a joint venture because there was no evidence in any police reports other than the wiretap um, that Barrett was even involved. And he took the wiretap uh, as indication that they were trying to get information on Mr. Weichel through Mr. Barrett. But, but wasn't there evidence that uh, it, right after the shooting, Foley or somebody saw uh, the shooter getting into the passenger side of the car and the car immediately drove off? There was no clear evidence as to which side the, per the individual got was into. Was there any evidence? Never mind clear evidence. Was there any evidence? There, I believe that Lisa Krauss may have testified 
that um, she believed that he got into the passenger seat, but her credibility was attacked during the hearings because she identified a different well, there individual. Was, there was evidence about the car taking off immediately. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, but there was also evidence that the car had been running. So there's no individual getting into the passenger seat with a car that's running could have taken off immediately. Let me, let me ask you this. Of course, the, the, the crux here is that, um, that uh, Whitey Bulger and Stevie Flemmy uh, together in some fashion threatened your client that he was under no circumstances ever to mention Tommy Barrett in connection with anything. And that this, these meetings occurred shortly after the crime and before the trial. Is that right? Yes. All right. What evidence was there, if any, um, and I see you've got Patrick Nee's affidavit here, yes. but was there any further development at the motion for a new trial hearing on why the Bulger gang would want to protect Tommy Barrett? Was he part of their operation? Was there anything developed of that sort? There was nothing developed in the testimony other than from the defendant that there was a relationship between Mr. Barrett, and, Mr. Barrett's family, and, and the Bulger family. And Patrick Nee testifies that. Uh, oh, Patrick Nee did not testify. Excuse me. He gives an affidavit. Is yes. that Was that submitted into evidence? Did the judge have that? That was submitted as the in initial support of the motion, hearing? Okay. and we did not present him at the hearing. Okay. So, Mr. Weichel knows for how many years was it that this letter existed? At the time of the motion for new trial, it would have been 20 years plus. 20 years. And he makes no time. effort to go after it for 20 years. He had no idea that the letter still existed, Your Honor. He had no idea that his mother hadn't thrown the letter away. He had no information. What, he, did, what, did, he, what did he say he knew about the letter? I mean, I don't, generally speaking, people don't know what letters their mother gets. She, she called him at some point and said, I've had a letter. No, he was on the phone with her because he was in prison at the time. Right. Um, and she indicated that Tommy Barrett had written a letter to her. Um, so at that point, he knows it could be an important letter. He doesn't know whether it could be an important, and that's what he testified to. There was no inflection in well, his mother's he, voice. Well, he knows Barrett. Yes. They hung out together. Yes. They're both part of the Whitey, Whitey Bulger operation, right? We can infer that. I'm not... Well, I can't infer what Whitey and Flemmy threatened him, if you do anything about Barrett, we're going to kill you. The comment whether Whitey was involved in the, in the Whitey Bulger, I don't yeah. know that. See, this seems like thin stuff to overturn a murder conviction to me on the newly discovered evidence. Wait a minute. But just to go back, so that he, he is in prison, correct? Yes. And I take it that he assumes that um, his telephone conversations are being recorded in some way, correct? Yes. And he's talking to his mother, yes. and his mother says, I have a letter from Tommy Barrett. Yes. And he says? He says, I cannot discuss Tommy Barrett. Okay. So he says, that's a perfectly reasonable thing for somebody in prison to do. Um, but does he make any effort to find out what Barrett has said to his mother? No, he did not. Isn't that the problem here? He doesn't have to have said over that telephone conversation, but shouldn't he have at least made inquiry? Why can't he call Cardin Mr. Cardinale and say, come down here, I want I you to find out what's in that letter that my mother's got from Mr. Barrett? Why couldn't he do that? At the time, he had already filed motions for new trial against Attorney Cardinale for ineffective assistance of counsel. So he well, gets get his, that lawyer to well, get down and get his yeah, lawyer. Yeah, get that lawyer to go do it. Why couldn't he do that? I can't answer that question. Well. No, you, it's not that you can't answer the question. I mean, I, perfect, you know, I'm not asking you to answer the question, but why should we not assume that that was a deliberate waiver? In other words, it's not newly discovered. He may choose not to do anything with it because he is afraid that his mother's life will be threatened, that he will be threatened, I mean, maybe for very good reasons, but why doesn't he at very minimum find out what's in that letter? Your Honor, it was not unusual for Mr. Barrett to communicate and write to his mother. Um, they had a, the mother and Mr. Barrett had a friendly relationship, so that it's not unusual that the mother would say that she talked to Tommy or there was a letter from Tommy. So oh, there's I nothing understand. unusual in, I got a letter from Tommy. No, I understand, but if, it would seem to me that, generally speaking, if a mother gets information that somebody else, that, that your son has been convicted of murder in the first degree and is serving a life sentence, that even if the mother didn't say anything on the phone into the prison, which is okay, 
that she presumably knew who represented um, <clears throat> uh, her son, or she could have found out in another conversation, you know, who's your lawyer, and she could have gone to the law. I mean, there are lots of things that could have. Yeah. In other words, there may have been a reason not to bring this up at a motion for a new trial, but I don't think the defendant can say, well, I was too afraid even to look or to explore or to say my mother never did anything with it if it was in fact I wasn't there at all and somebody else has done it. He didn't know the contents of it, Your Honor. He would have no reason to, it, it would be a fishing expedition for him to try to locate whether the letter still existed. He had no reason to believe it contained anything. Why couldn't and he say mother, to the mother, bring the letter down here on your next visit to see me in prison and let's look at it? Because he received information that he was not to have any communications or anything regarding Tommy Barrett. If his mother came to the prison with the letter and he started having discussions regarding Tommy Barrett, then in his mind, the fear was so great so, that he so didn't we, even want to bring her into we that. We decide this subjectively on what a defendant thinks is newly discovered evidence and not objectively on what appears could be evidence that he could have found a long time ago? I, I would say that it what is. What the defendant thinks is going to be the standard? I would say that it is newly discovered evidence that Judge Bornstein assessed his credibility in that he did not know of the contents and that based upon the testimony of Weichel's aunt regarding the fear of the mother and based upon Weichel's own testimony about his fear that that bolstered his credibility, that he was highly credible and that he would not have had no reason based on that to go look into this letter. He was told to keep his mouth shut. He kept his mouth shut. Could I ask you to shift to a, a different topic on the questions of whether these uh, confessions of Barrett would be admissible? How do you meet the corroboration uh, component of that test? It seems to me Judge Bornstein's opinion just tries to corroborate it by corroborating that this, this really is a letter from Barrett rather than corroborating, you know, is there anything suggesting that, that Barrett really is the shooter. Is there anything to corroborate that? He made the statement, um, and it came out through Sherry Robb's testimony, that he made the statement to a, an individual that he actually was the individual that committed that crime. Oh. So that the letter was bolstered by the testimony of Sherry Robb, who received the confession directly uh, so from he told Mr. Barrett. It, so he made the confession to, to more twice. than one person. That, but that's he made it twice to the same person. But that's not corroboration. But that's not corroboration. I mean, and it, it's, as I understand, at least I haven't obviously haven't read the transcripts, but, but uh, we have here a, an eyewitness who is a stranger, identified the defendant from photographs, and that defendant, the person he identified, just happened to be somebody who was acquainted with the victim and on bad terms with him. Um, and again, I'm, I haven't looked through the record. Commonwealth's brief says that uh, Barrett bears no resemblance to the defendant. That's actually incorrect. And actually, um, the Honorable Hanlon testified that as a district attorney, she indicated that all of the individuals at that time had the curly type hairstyle. On, on cross examination, she was asked, Isn't it true that young men in the, in the South Boston area at that time had curly hair, as did Sherry Robb? Who was the individual Barrett, t Barrett confessed to? All right, well, so even if you take that part out of it, even if you take that part out of it, where is the corroboration of Barrett's involvement in the crime as the shooter? In the letter, he says that he killed LaMonica. No, no, yeah. The corroboration no, has to be outside of the confession itself. That's the whole point of the corroboration requirement when it's a, it's a confession uh, being offered to uh, exculpate the accused. Do you have proof well, that would, did he own the same caliber of a gun? Well, let me put it to you differently. Do you have anything to corroborate? His, his, the, well, go ahead. What, what was the Commonwealth's evidence of joint venture? I mean, I suppose if you were looking for corroboration. There were two police informants and two police officers who in the original police investigation indicated that they had information that both Weichel and Barrett were involved in this murder. But that's not going to help your client. No. no. So what fact, extrinsic fact, besides Barrett's statements, corroborate the fact that he may have committed the murder? I would suggest that the, the information that his flight at the time of the trial, he fled the jurisdiction um, 
after he had a wiretap placed on him. The wiretap transcript itself had him in a panic when the police came to him and questioned him, frantically trying to get into, in touch with Fred Weichel. Clearly, his actions at the time of the investigation corroborate the fact that he was involved in this. And then his flight is his consciousness of guilt. He remained out of the Commonwealth during the entire trial. Then once the conviction occurs, writes the letter. And at that point, writing the letter because he had already been concerned that he was going to be targeted in this crime as well. If you, if you, re, if you review the, the record on this and the, tri, the transcript of the wiretap, it clearly says that he is frantically, over and over and over again, attempting to get in touch with Weichel. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Thank you. <clears throat>